Hey, the, the time is almost gone on 8.30. We're, we're, we're about to start, so please um, make yourself comfortable. And um, <clears throat> we've got 175 participants, so it's an amazing, uh, an amazing audience, and, and uh, I'm not going to waste too much time, so I want to just welcome everyone. It's 8.30. And welcome to Limud Live with the South African Jewish Report and to the session with Ruta Vanagaita, um, which is the destruction of Lithuanian Jewry, 80 years of silence. And as I've mentioned a couple of times in the last minutes, I think a topic that really resonates with so many South African Jews, given the strong connection between South African Jewry and Lithuania. Um, as always, I'm sure many of you are Limud veterans, but just to re-emphasize some of the values of, of Limud, uh, specifically respect, respect for opinions, respect for, 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 for everyone in the audience, uh, arguments for the sake of heaven, and we're here to build connections. And as you can see, a very strong connection between our topic tonight and so many of you. The chat room is open, and I can see you, you're all familiar with your chat room. So everyone is going to be put on to mute automatically. So please, as Ruta is talking, if there are topics that are familiar, if you want to ask questions, if you've got a comment to make, um, um, please post it up in the chat rooms. I will be monitoring the questions. So Ruta will get through her presentation and then we will endeavor to get through as many questions as you can, as we can in the, the, the 15, 10 or 15 minutes. Um, that will take us up to, to 9.15. Please turn on your cameras. Um, it's nice to have some, some, some visuals for, for the presenter um, so that we're not just talking to a blank screen. You will be on mute, but please put on your, your, your cameras, use your, your, your chats, um, and just interact and comment. And if it brings back memories or something that, that you can recall from both your life in Lithuania, if you're first generation or something that your grandparents or parents spoke about, give us a thumbs up or a clapping of the hands on the bottom right in the reaction screen. Um, and, uh, and please interact with us as, as much as possible. But you're not here to, to, to listen to, to me. We're really here to listen about the destruction of Lithuanian jury, uh, 80 years of silence. And we're deeply on it to have with us someone who I know that the Lumut South African delegation heard, I think, Ruta in 2017. They heard you speak. They've been endeavoring to get you either to South Africa um, or to present at Limud. And so they're really excited three years later to have you presenting here at Limud Live with the, 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 the Jewish Report. Uh, Ruta is a journalist and author who co-wrote a book, Our People, with Nazi hunter Efrain Zurov. And in her session tonight, she will talk about the, the silence of Lithuania on the destruction of the Jews. Ruta, we are deeply honored to have you here tonight uh, um, um, on, on the Mood Live. And so without further ado, I'm going to hand over the, the presentation to you. And uh, thank you so much for taking the time from Vilnius in Lithuania to join us and talk and give us your story about the Jews. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be talking to, to, to you. I'm very happy that so many people join my session and also very happy for those of you, for all of you, because your ancestors left Lithuania way before it, all the hor horrible things start happening in my country. I'm not Jewish. I don't have a blood of Jewish, uh, a drop of Jewish blood. And uh, I would like to speak about this eight years of silence, starting from 60 years of silence about the Jews in my own life. Like I was born in Soviet Union, in Soviet Lithuania, and uh, during my education and during my young years and adult years, we Lithuanians, we didn't care about the Holocaust. In Soviet times, there was no word as Holocaust. Nobody was speaking about it. We knew that like Soviet citizens, some Soviet citizens were murdered and of course some fascists murdered them. So there is no Holocaust education. There was no Holocaust education in the Soviet times. And uh, my children, uh, now they are 25 and, and 32, 
they were studying in independent Lithuania, and I would say that they know not much more than I was taught or knew in the Soviet times. Like we have in Lithuania, we have uh, one and a half lesson about the Holocaust. Uh, sometimes one, sometimes one and a half, and everybody knows the same story. There were, you know, a lot of Jews living in Lithuania. Then uh, Nazis came and murdered those Jews, and then we switch our topic to those, to the righteous among the nations, to those people who are saving the Jews, because Lithuania was so famous saving so many Jews. But we sk stay silent about the figure how many Jews were murdered in Lithuania. Anyway, but like for sixty years, I lived in in total ignorance and indifference. And I knew that one of my uh, my grandfather was uh, like um, the, was deported by the Soviets, and then I discovered that he was like when uh, Germans came to Lithuania, he was part of some kind of Nazi commission, and he made a list in Kalarskas, in the middle of Lithuania, in Kalarska, a list of Soviet activists, and those Soviet activists were shot. But okay, so maybe though they were Jews, maybe not Jews, it didn't. I mean, it didn't interest me, it didn't interest my relatives, didn't interest my friends. He was my hero because he was deported to Gulag and he was murdered. There was a, a, a husband of my aunt who was chief of police in famous city of Ponevich in 41, from 41 to 44. And my family knew. Then he, in 44, he fled to America and uh, lived in a nice house with mango tea in Florida, and he died. And during Soviet times, he was sending us jeans and beat records. In the difficult times, me and my sister, we had jeans from our wonderful uh, uh, husband of my aunt. So he was also a hero for me. And there was something about the Jews. He was shooting Jews, so he was commanding. We talked about it, but we were not interested. My parents were not interested to tell us. I was not interested to ask. And I'm a very typical product of Lithuania. Not the, I'm not the least educated person in this country. And I didn't know anything. And my children don't know anything. We never went to Ponar. If we would go to Ponar, we maybe would go skiing or walking our dog, because the Jews, tragedy of the Jews was not a tragedy of native Lithuanians. And it stayed this way, unfortunately. They were those people, not our people. Our tragedy, like deportation, was the biggest. So this was a silence of my 60 years. And only when I was 60, I got into one lecture by a Lithuanian historian by accident, when I learned in 45 minutes, I learned the truth about the Holocaust. That there was not just Nazis, there were a lot of Lithuanians who were participating, and that the Holocaust happened not only at the pits. 200,000 Jews were murdered, and three fourths of them in half a year from Ju July 41 till uh, November 41. How can a bunch of degenerates or some Nazis kill 200,000 people? And it's not about only killing. It's about making the list. It's about putting them in one place. It's about guarding them. It's about selecting the place where to murder the, person, the, the, the Jews. It's about convoying them. It's about digging the pits, it's about covering the pits, and it's about distributing the property. I was listening to this lecture and I was shocked. I said, what? What property? Lithuanians, they are Catholic people, they are nice people. They wouldn't take any property. But then you start giving an example, it's like 200,000 people. It means 50,000 homes. It means beds, it means bed linen, it means toys, it means everything. Germans didn't take it. They didn't take the houses. They didn't take tables, beds, and, and then I was sitting and thinking, I have a clock, a clock in my house. I can show you maybe wherever it is. You see on the on the on the wall. It's from my it's from my uh, uh, grandmother who was living in Ponovich in 41. And then I realized that. The, such a big amount of people were part of this horrible tragedy. And then I started investigating. 
I started when I was already 61 or 62, I started 2015. And the more I read, I went to the archives to read uh, interrogation protocols of the murderers. I worked for one year from night, from morning till night in the archives, reading Lithuanian books of Lithuanian historians who wrote truth, but very dry, and reading the uh, testimonies of, of the murderers. And what I read shocked me enormously. And you know what shocked me? The silence of the murder. You know that uh, we have 234 places of mass murder in Lithuania. Actually, everybody can drive or walk to mass murder site within half an hour. 234. And all these places are in the forest, in the vicinity of, of, uh, of the city, because Jews, most, most of them, they were walked to the, to the pits. I mean, nobody would drive them anywhere. And then there is a forest, and then normally it's like a, a little hill, and the pit were dug behind the hill. So people wouldn't, wouldn't uh, 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 citizen of different cities or, or villages wouldn't hear the screaming, they wouldn't hear uh, the shooting. So the murder of Lithuanian Jews happened with a silent, silent consent of, uh, of, uh, of a society in general, of local people. Of course they knew, but everybody was silent about it. And you know what the most horrible thing? That the church was silent. There was no reaction, because Lithuanians were Catholics, they were deeply religious at that time, 41, 44. The church took a decision not to interfere. If they would have told people, don't shoot, don't shoot, it's a, it's, it's a sin to shoot. They wouldn't, they, many people, many Lithuanians wouldn't have done it. And uh, another horrible image of the silence was for me like in the testimonies of witnesses, those witnesses who saw the murders of Lithuanian people or who were living, uh, who were uh, uh, interviewed by Soviets you know, after, after the war, all of them said that Earth was moving a week after, after the murder. I couldn't believe it. How the hell? I mean, who can believe such a story that you know, people are murdered, then they covered with Earth, and Earth is moving? Yes, it was moving. I tell you one thing which shocked me. When so many people are murdered, there's a lot of gases. And the earth was moving. So that was about the time of the murders. And another time, another thing that shocked me is that those people who were killing the Jews, they were not sadists. They were not monsters. They were just ordinary countryside men who went into this uh, murder battalions without knowing that they're going to have, they will be ordered to, to murder innocent people. They wanted, you know, when Germans came, everybody thought, okay, Germany going to give Lithuanian independence. So people joined the battalions because they thought, okay, we're going to go, we're going to be uh, uh, independent, beginning of Lithuanian independent army, and we're going to serve our country because we love our country, we hate Soviets. And those people, there were like 26 battalions in Lithuania, in each of them were from 500 to 700 people. Half of these battalions were sent to murder the Jews. And they were in shock. They didn't know they had to shoot the women or had to shoot children, but they did it. I always thought that they were forced to, that every Lithuanian who would go and shoot the Jew had a German behind him who would shoot him if he wouldn't obey the orders. No, there is not a single documented case in the whole Lithuania that somebody would refuse to shoot a Jew, an innocent person, and would have been shot himself. There is a gossip about one person in Kaunas. So why people did it? Why did they do it? It means, you know, there is a... All of them said that we like became like robots. They, something changed in their head that they didn't think about the Jews as people. 
and they every one of them had a justification for themselves like if the god allows such atrocity if my government is sending me to this battalion if my commander sets gives me a, a rifle and sets me to shoot i'm a small person what can i do if i wouldn't shoot, shoot that jew the, my neighbor would shoot another soldier would shoot so they felt innocent and they had explanation for themselves why they are doing this so it i was in such a shock that a normal human being can do such a horrifying thing and don't doesn't feel innocent doesn't feel guilty there is a like very very shocking example i can tell you like uh, uh, a a young guy named Antanas Shevzde was studying in, in Taurage in Teachers Academy in 41. And he was like the, 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 the university or the academy uh, year uh, was over. And in June, he, he needed some work for, for, for summer, like 41, June, end of June. And somebody told you can go register yourself and they will set you, uh, send you to register Jewish property. So you went there to register Jewish property. You know, where is property coming from? Everybody knows what is coming from, but I mean, you just registered and you could take something because you wouldn't register everything. You would take, you know, like a watch or something. So you got a little bit better off. And then he was sent to convoy the Jews to the work. So he took a big group of Jews with other, uh, other members of his school or whatever, and he was taking them convoying them somewhere to the work. And then you saw there's no work, there's a pit. And those Jews are being shot by other soldiers. And then he realized that, okay, those bad people are shooting the Jews. They are so bad, but he is good. He doesn't shoot them. So he started coming to every Jew and saying, you know what, you're gonna die anyway. And I am a good person. So give me your money, give me your watch. You don't need it anymore. And they gave him watches, they gave him money. And after the war, he bought a violin and went to play violin in the State Theater of Shavel Shaule. How people are adaptive, how they are sliding into the crime. And if those people could have gone into that crime, it's, it means you can be repeated. We are not any better. And uh, so while studying this book, I realized that I have to go to mass murder sites, not to 234. Of course, I couldn't do it. I have to go at least to 20, 30, 50. I'm afraid of the forest. I'm get, getting lost very easily. I don't know how to change a tire. And those forests are really deep. And those places of mass murder, some is, are easy to find. We have some official places where, you know, people or officials go once a year, Holocaust Memorial Day, one in Kaunas, one in Vilnius. We have a, a, a PR, Jewish PR, a violin player. So we bring a, some flowers and that's it until next year. But there are another 232 places where nobody's going. And I met uh, Efraim Zurov, Nazi hunter, and I realized that I should ask him, maybe you should go with me. Because his, uh, some of his relatives are from, from uh, Lithuania and one of his relatives was murdered in Ponar. And he agreed. And we got into my car, which he called Shoah Mobile, and we went to mass murder sites for tens. Maybe we visited 50 of them. We visited uh, 10 in Belarus because the uh, Belarusian uh, Lithuanian battalion was also brought there to murder Soviet activists in Belarus. And that were th those people were Jews, 15,000 Jews were murdered in Belarus by, by, by Lithuanian battalion. And what happened, we started going into little villages or little houses next to mass murder sites and asking people, old people, do you remember, do you know? Did you see? Though nobody has interviewed those people before us. And they remember. You imagine, like it was like two years ago. Uh, it, I believe no murderers are alive anymore because in order to be uh, uh, serve in the battalion, you had to be at least 18 years old. But those people who were kids at that time, seven, eight years old, six years old, and 41, 
Now they are 80. They are 285. They saw it. They remember. And they were crying. Then I saw another Lithuania. I saw Lithuania of old people who saw it and they remember every detail. They remember what color was the sky on that night when the Jews were shot. They remember that some of the people uh, climbed out of the, of the graves and were half alive, half dead, and came crawling into their houses. But those people are going to die. Who are going to collect the testimonies? I collected as much as I, as I could we were traveling with the frame, but people wouldn't agree to be filmed. They wouldn't agree to be photographed. They wouldn't agree to give their names. It was so scary for them that they preferred to stay silent and only tell to me because they knew me. I a, was a, like a famous writer or whatever. So they trusted me and they told me their stories. I was deeply affected by all this. And the sad thing was that when I decided to write this book, write this book with Ephraim, I started writing chapter after chapter after chapter. I asked many of my friends, my children, my relatives, would you read this book? Everybody said no. And the explanation was very different. Why, why are you writing about the Jews? We Lithuanians have our own tragedies. Let Jews write about the Jews. Are Jews paying you? It all, maybe you are Jewish. So I knew that nobody was going to read this book, but we wrote it. And this book became a national bestseller immediately because it was written in a very emotional way, way in a very simple language. So they published 2,000 copies, and soon it was sold in 24 hours. And then the book reached the circulation of 19,000 copies. So it means 100,000 people in small Lithuania read it. And a lot of people said, no, we're not going to read it. It's all lies. Jews paid her. Russians paid her. She's Jewish. We, we don't agree to read this book. And to make this long story short, you know what? A Holocaust is like a black hole. Once you touch it, you cannot get out. You still think you want to visit this mass grave. You want to go there. You want to know more. You want to defend the victims. And uh, what happened, I mean, I won't go into the detail, but like uh, two years later, I said something, a very nasty comment about one of Lithuanian national leaders. And uh, next day, I was told by my media that my publisher is removing all my books, including this book about the Holocaust. This is... Uh, this book about the Holocaust, removing from bookshelves. So I now I have twenty seven thousand books in my uh, in my garage, and no bookstore will take them. And that that time it was not pleasant to be on the street because people start attacking me, spitting on me that I'm a Jewish agent, I'm paid by the Jews, I sold my country. I don't want to go into it, but it was very unpleasant. And then I left for. Uh, Israel for three years. I, you know, my plan was to finish with this book. Once I did something for the victims, I did the book, I wrote the truth, and the book made the subject, an important subject, very important for people who hated it and for people who, who really cared about this tragedy. But I thought after me, Maybe young writers will start writing. Maybe young uh, theater directors, young movie directors, because I open, I open the dam. It should have become a, a general subject for everyone. It didn't happen because when my books were removed, so the silence of Lithuania remained. People remained silent, and then I had to do something about it. And I did something about it. So we just a month ago. I self-published another book about the Holocaust with the most famous and the best uh, Holocaust historian in the world. He's called Christoph Dickmann. And they asked him simple questions and he gave me the answers. And the picture is even gloomier and even more tragic than we thought. To give you just a couple of examples, I. I asked him about the German occupation of Lithuania because Lithuania was occupied by Germans, right? Four years was German Nazi occupation, so that's why uh, Lithuanian Jews were murdered. 
you know how many, what was the German occupation? We had from 600 to 900 Germans in Lithuania during all these years. We had uh, civil servants in the uh, Nazi administration. They were, they were like a couple of hundred. In each city, we had from six to nine Germans and thousands of Lithuanians. So servility of my country, that was so shocking for me, that they decided to serve the Nazis without being forced into it. And, uh, or say, the, the, the biggest crime of my people, and not, not really persecution, persecution of the Jews, not, not because like a couple of thousand participated, of course, 20,000 civil servants participated also, but the robbery of Jewish property. In every in, in summer 41, every village, every little town had a commission of redistribution Jewish property. So it was not like robbery that everybody would, would take anything. No, it was everything was written, everything was guarded, and the commission would distribute it. The first, you know, of course, something went to Germans, then for went for Lithuanian administration, and then auctions of Jewish property. And people were, Jews were still alive in small ghettos, and people were dragging horses and carriages with stuff, dishes, uh, tablecloths, uh, bed linen, shoes, everything. And when you think that maybe in every Lithuanian house, if we have now something antique or something old, nice furniture, or Zinger sewing machine or whatever, where did it come from? That's why we don't want to talk about it. That's why we don't want to hear it, because Holocaust is present in every house. So this book came out, and uh, there was a total silence about it. No bookstore will take it. This is, I, I show you the first book. Now it came in English. It came in English in March. It's uh, called Our People. It's available on Amazon. And the second book we wrote in English with Christoph Dickman because he doesn't speak Lithuanian. We wrote in English, but it's a question of principle to publish first in Lithuania. No publisher will take it, no bookstore will take it, but it's just there. How did it happen? And this, there you see a nice map of Lithuania with a lot of like bullet marks. And what is important about this book it's not shocking in a way, it's very calm, it's very simple, but it, exactly, it says exactly how did it happen. This is the ultimate book about the Holocaust. Nobody can, uh, this uh, Christoph Dickman, he studied uh, Holocaust in Lithuania for, for uh, uh, 20 years, in 30 archives in seven countries and in seven languages, including Hebrew, Yiddish, English, uh, Lithuanian, Russian, and of course, German and French. He knows everything. The only difficult thing for me when we decided to write this book, a simple book of talk, me asking simple questions and him answering, that a uh, Lithuanian historian said, don't, uh, don't do anything with this woman. She's scandalous, she's this, she's that, and it took him a lot of time to start trusting me. But he trusted me, and we published it. And this book will come in English in spring, spring next year. Sad book, but this is the ultimate book about the Holocaust. And when I am dead, which it will not happen next year or within 10 years or 15 years, when I am dead, this book will be in every Lithuanian school, like an ultimate and important important book about the Holocaust. So I'm going to live in this book too. Thank you very much. I am ready to answer your questions. And uh, thank you for your attention. Ruta, thank you so much for, for a very, very moving uh, presentation and um, so many amazing comments. Um, uh, you're an incredible journalist and thank you for being so brave and for doing your part to end the silence. Um, I wanted to just ask you, so I know that your co-author, um, 
a Pfizer of said in 2010 that that not anywhere else in I think the world he was quoted as saying has a country done so little to acknowledge their past or done so much to silence their 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 past. Um, Israel's president Benjamin Netanyahu visited Lithuania. I think it was quite controversial in 2018. Have you seen um, Have you seen a shift in in the in the government's position since since you the know, Prime you Minister? Know what? You know, you don't make me mad, okay? Mr. Netanyahu could come to Lithuania and you know shake hands with the with the Lithuanian counterparts and prime minister and presidency you know what why don't you put more education into schools why don't you remove monuments for the murderers he didn't do anything because netanyahu israel needs lithuania when the some uh, uh, voting or uh, happens in 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 un or whatever he doesn't want to make friends angry but somebody, he's, his, his uh, uh, ancestors are from Shaduva, from Lithuania. He owes it to the victims. And then our Lithuanian government, if, if the Jews are not asking for justice, if they are not asking to remove the, 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 the monuments for the murderers, they won't do it. Yeah, very sad. Ruta, you, you mentioned before the talk started that um, that you had spent three years in Israel, and and, and part of that was just that you 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 weren't comfortable in in Lithuania. Did you did you ever feel no. that you, you were threatened, or that potentially your, your safety was was at risk for 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 what you were doing to expose these atrocities? You know what, and you know when I said these things about the partisan uh, leader. So our first president of Lithuania, first actual president, his name is Vito Taslansbikis, wrote an op-ed in a popular portal telling that I should go to the forest and hang myself. And then there was internet full of words of my face with a loop, with a loop. And then you go, you go in the street and they call you the, the woman who should be hanged. It's not funny. And my kids told me, mom, you don't go out without us. You never go alone. We, I start uh, ordering food home. So how much you can stay like this? How long? And I had, you know, found a lot of wonderful friends in Israel. But of course, I mean, like my, it was from the, from the side of the government or Yad Vashem or whatever, I was never received nicely, only by private people. So by now, all my visas have expired and uh, I cannot stay in Israel anymore. But I think in Lithuania, they almost got me. Not, I mean, at least people are not spitting on the street into my face. It's not pleasant, believe me, when they spit. Let me ask, there's a question here. Um, why, why did the Lithuanians act like that? So you mentioned in your talk that you found that there, there was, wasn't one documented incident where, where the Lithuanian soldiers were threatened by the German soldiers. Where, where does this, and, and I, I guess many of the audience may be smiling because, you know, where, where does this deep-rooted anti-Semitism from in, in Lithuania and in, in Eastern Europe? You know, it is a big part of Catholic Church, like in Poland and Lithuania. Catholic Church is very anti-Semitic and has long history of anti-Semitism and the silence of the third church. But also, you know, there were like a lot of um, unhappy circumstances came together. Not that Lithuanians were particularly bad or particularly anti-Semitic. There was a lot of patriotism because the people thought that Jews are bad for the country. That was Hitler's propaganda, which was multiplied and repeated by Lithuanian government, Lithuanian media. Jews are guilty for everything. And another thing was deep Lithuanian trauma, because in 40, Lithuania met Soviets with a lot of friendliness. And then Soviets started deporting thousands of Lithuanians, hundreds, tens of thousands. And who is guilty? The Jews. If you ask any average Lithuanian who, who greeted Soviets, Soviet army in 40, Jews, the Jews. So we put our own shame and our own guilt 
to uh, on on the Jews. And then when Lithuanians start doing, you know, not, not so many pogroms, they forced the rabbis, the old rabbis, to carry Stalin's portraits. What the rabbis have to do with Stalin or Lenin? But we had to give our guilt to them, and then it was easy to demonize them. But those guys who murdered Jews, most of them, they were not even anti-Semitic. They were indifferent, and they thought that they served the country, you know? So, and they were not monsters. I'm sad to say they were not monsters. I, I, I read the poetry that they were writing. But you know what, like, there are many interesting stories, like those people who have been murdering Jews for four years. One of them, after the war, he married and he got a child. And neighbors were very surprised that he couldn't hold the child in his hands. Every time he would take his girl, little girl, the baby, he would start shaking and had to put her aside because he murdered so many babies. So something happened in their minds. But I am sure that at the times of crisis, always we need a Jew. Yeah. We Christians, we need a Jew. And the times of crisis, do you know what my friends already told that Soros invented uh, Corona? Yeah. Yeah. You heard it too. I heard it from yeah. my friend. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and Ruti, you made the comment earlier, I see there's a comment from Selwyn. Um, it, why is Lithuania starting to acknowledge the existence of, of Jewish life by marking buildings and streets where, where Jewish people lived and, and, and worshipped? It, it, is there a genuine effort today in 2020, even though there's a long way to go, to somehow just tell the story, even if it's just a beginning? You know, it is like I think you know what my my and the friend's book did a good thing that people became aware that Jews were there, that this tragedy happened, and they start looking for the signs. If I go now to mass murder site now, I would see a flower, I would see a, a, a stone, I would see that people go. They are not so indifferent. Many of them still are, but many of them already. Oh my goodness, it really happened. You know, in, in look if. Uh, 70,000 uh, 70, books were sold before they removed the gout. 70,000 books, it means uh, like 100,000 people read it. The book Our People was number one bestseller for half a year, a book about the Holocaust. So it means that they are people, but they are somewhere. They are not talking in public. They are not talking about the Jews or Holocaust. Still, if you say to at the table the word Jew, or what the Holocaust people freeze and change the subject. It is such a deep national trauma that until the next generation, or maybe the next generation, you don't talk about this in the in the in the normal in the company of other people. I've got a question here from Gavin Rome. Can you ask why why Israeli state civil organizations Yad Vashem? are so unhelpful in, in, in breaking the silence in, in Lithuania? I think you, you alluded to it earlier. It's a national, you know, Israel has so many uh, 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 acute issues nowadays that who cares about what happened eight years ago? Yeah. They need one vote from Lithuania. They need Lithuania to vote the way they want to vote. So why should make you know like Israeli ambassador told me, we don't make we don't make our friends angry. Yeah, yeah. So it's the, it's the balance of, of of our heritage and 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 politics. Ruta, let me let me ask you as, as we head towards the, the end of the, the, the session, there are amazing comments coming in. Uh, I see from Ros Bash, my cousin Sulamit Levy lived in Vilnius, and he actually wrote about in his memoir, seeing Jewish bodies in the Dnieper River. He was, he was a child at the time. How, how, is it, how are these books and how is the story going to get to the younger generations of Lithuanians? This generation um, who, who were part of or completed or who lived through it, may, maybe a generation um, that, that are lost. But how does your book and how does the story get traction with the generations of young Lithuanians coming. You know, slowly but definitely, like Christoph Dickman says, you see that our book is going, you know, by word of mouth. Somebody read it and said, it is very strong. Somebody started reading and they couldn't. 
because it brings to a very dark thoughts about our own nation. It's, this new book is not full of horrible facts, but it's a very sad book because it says how many people and people who had choice has, have chosen to do a bad thing. I chosen not necessarily to kill, but take a, for example, like a bed linen of someone who was just murdered. Like it's very, very sad diagnosis about human nature, about the nature of our country, which we want to be, we want our nation to be a nation of heroes, a nation of victims. No, they were not. But I think Lithuanians are adult people and they can look in their own history as adult people, not as kids who would want to believe in, in Santa Claus. I am adult. I expect other people to be adult too. So next generation, like generation of my kids and their kids, they will be open. They won't be anti-Semitic, I don't believe. Unless really the Jews have invented Corona. It's, it's, uh, we're, we're all hopeful. Lorraine is asking a question. When the Soviets occupied Lithuania after the war, did they establish courts to try any Nazi sympathizers as they did in East Germany and the Ukraine, for example? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Those people who were uh, imprisoned, sent to Siberia or shot dead were done only by Soviets. But that time, there was in all these interrogation protocols, there was not a word about the Jews. That was Soviet citizens, and those who, were, who shot them were bourgeois nationalists. So like identity of the victims was kind of hidden. But yes, they were caught, they were, they were uh, put to, a lot of them were shot. But after the independence, not a single person was punished. Ruta, I'm going to just, there's, there's a lot of questions about your book. So I just want to repeat the name of, of the book. The book is called Our People. It's yes. co written by, yes. uh, by Ruta van der Geite. She's holding the book up. And Nazi hunter Ephraim Zurov. I have checked if someone else posted up. It is available or certainly listed as available on loot, L O O T dot C O dot Z A. I'm not sure if they have in stock. But Ruta, what I what I am what I am gonna do is I will find out and we'll post it up in Limud. They will have email addresses and see if it is available in South Africa and, and maybe we can help you to 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 get rid of some of the, the 27,000 books sitting in your in your garage because I, I think there would be really good demand. Everyone is asking about the book. So I'll do some research and see if it's available. Yes. If it's not well, it's available on Amazon. An English book is available on Amazon. On Amazon as well, or potentially yeah. maybe we can, we, we can get we can get those those books. What was maybe just one last question? Um, Ros Bass is asking: Was the financial reparation due to the Jews by the Lithuanian government the cause of the denials and and the the the, the silence? Um, there was even a huge conflict between the Mishkadim and the 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 Lubavitches. Uh, I didn't get the question about the. So, so do do you think that that part of the reason for the denials and the, and the silence was about the Lithuanian Lithuanian government having to pay reparations for for their their, their role? No, I mean, who is paying? Lithuania is paying to Jewish community only for communal property, only. And uh, Jewish community gets uh, uh, 3 million, I think 3 million euros each, each year for projects, but it's, it's not a private property. If you go to little, little uh, cities, little shtetls, you see a lot of, a lot of uh, Jewish houses. They are not being returned. And if you are a Lithuanian citizen, you won't get back your property. Okay, Ruta, we're, we're about to end the session. I want to thank you so much. People are posting up the most amazing stories, um, sad, full of emotion. Um, so thank you for, firstly, thank you for doing the work that you, you do. Thank you for, for telling the story, not only to us, but in your country of Lithuania and, and around the world, and for being as brave as you, as you are. You're, you're an amazing, amazing person. Uh, I think your story has resonated with all of us. We look forward to reading your book. Um, and, Thank you. And, and may Hashem continue to bless the work that you do and bless you and keep you and your family safe in Lithuania. Amen. To everyone, we wish you a great week as we enter the month of Elul. 
thank you to Limud for getting Ruta to present to us and to the Savior and Jewish report and uh, wish you all a fantastic evening and, uh, and enjoy your second sessions. You. Take care and be safe and thank you so, thank so much. Shavua tov lekulam. Shavua tov. Shavua tov. Thank you, everybody.